insurance agents from around the world. Hey guys, this is Scott Howell with the Insurance Guys Podcast. Hey, I've got a question for you guys. How many service calls do you get a day? How about a week? How about a month? More importantly, how many of those calls are revenue generating? If not, why are you still taking those calls? The reality is that clients don't want to call their agent for things like documents, billing, service requests. These are considered non-revenue generating activities that can and should be handled with a client experience platform, CXP. The rule of thumb is, can you rely on your technology to fully accomplish the same thing being asked over the phone? If the answer is yes, give the client that option, please. Now is the time to look into a CXP for your agency, a client experience platform. A CXP is a core system at your agency, just like your AMS, just like your CRM, just like your Raider. Having a client experience platform like Glovebox gives you a leg up on the competition and allows you to focus on sales, which we better all be focusing on because nothing else matters, and high-level service. Get a demo today with one of the glove box gurus and mention the Insurance Guys podcast to get 20% off your new CXP. Trust me when I say it's time to jump on the glove box platform. I know we've done it here in our agency. We love it. We're desperately trying to get all of our clients on the glove box platform, guys. Desperately. We want them on there. We want them to go get their ID cards there. We want to reduce the number of times they call the agency. And, and that frees us up to do more selling. That's all it does. Call today, get a demo, and join Glovebox. Take care. Insurance agents from around the world, welcome to the Insurance Guys podcast powered by Glovebox. God, I love Glovebox. My name is Scott Howell, your fearless host and agency owner for I Protect Insurance and Financial Services based out of Huntsville, Alabama. And before we get started on today's episode, please help me welcome, he is a six foot three sophomore from Sarah Land, Alabama, parade first team All-American, rivals five-star recruit. He is a fantastic insurance agent and a great American. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome the incomparable Mr. Bradley Flowers. How are you, Bradley? Great, Scott. How are you this morning? Best I have ever been. Sunny, 70 degrees outside. Guys, I've got breaking news this morning, Bradley. Uh Breaking news from Pine Ridge, Alabama. Actually, I've got a couple breaking news articles that we need to talk about. You know, we are the CNN and Fox of the insurance industry. Guys, it has been brought to my attention as of last night around 9 p.m. I received a phone call that notified me that Crackhead Christie... We'll be getting out of jail next week. My neighbor, she is coming back to steal everything that I own. (laughs) I thought you were about to say that they caught Jalen. That was the other update I had for you today. Oh, oh, my bad. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I've had numerous number of agents reach out to me. Give a brief update on Jalen in case somebody's listening to this that didn't listen to the other one. If you didn't listen last week, guys, I wrote a $19,771 refund check to one of our policyholders, sold the property. I can't remember exactly what happened, but it sold it. Something happened with it. And so he was owed a refund. The company sent the refund back to us at our agency, I Protect Insurance. So I was turning around and sending him his refund. I put it in the mail, put it in the envelope. Mr. Jalen Knowles decides in his infinite wisdom, He's going to take it somewhere. Don't know where he did it. Got it out of the mail, opened up the envelope. Then he used some form of whiteout that I think he had to have colored to kind of match the check because it was like a light blue colored check. He doctors that up, writes his name on the check, and then goes and deposits it. Here's the here's the update, guys. Here's where we are today. We have figured out. I'm on the edge of my seat. That check was deposited at a Bank of America. Ooh. I have been contacted by the investigators at Huntsville PD, and they are subpoenaing, if that's a word, 
the Bank of America records to determine exactly where that check was deposited. And they have also subpoenaed, now we're talking about nearly a $20,000 check that he's gotten out of the mail. He's, he partied hard, dude. He, he, he did a party home, hard on $19,000. Yeah, he did. Not, hey, he does a home ec project on my check so that he had to have colored the white out to match the check. Puts his name on the check. They are subpoenaing a the bank records, and they're also going to look into who actually opened that account so that they can backtrack this to whoever it was that opened the account because very well may not be a guy, person named Jalen Knowles. It may just yeah. be somebody else that created a fake account. I cannot believe that it was a Bank of America. I thought you were going to say it was one of these like yeah. cash for checks places. You know what I mean? Bank um, of America. That like is just one of those situations where uh, they just would put those skills and uh, talents to good use. They wouldn't have to be criminals, but you know, here, here we are. Oh, dude, yeah. The, uh, oh, dude, Scott, could could hire him as a, Scott could hire him as a graphic designer and like, <laughs> you know, pay him way more than $19,000. <laughs> So no, also no. Bradley, all of the, here's, here's how I instantly knew this had happened. So all of my checks that I use, I have the, uh, what do you call that? The back of the check where it, you know, it, it creates Watermark. a copy of it. Well, it, it's like, a God, what is it called? It's like oh, the got, uh, carbon, pe- carbon. Yeah. The carbon yeah. behind it. So yeah. as soon as she sent me the check and it exactly matched yeah. the check and check number I wrote, I was like, well, this, this can't be right. There's no way. You know, t- check wow. two one two matches both sides except the name. So, um, <laughs> and what's funny is 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 Scott called him out on the podcast two weeks ago or a week I ago. Last and there's week. people on Twitter like talk, yes. like I'm like this dude's like famous and has no idea. I'm like <laughs> putting him on blast. Yeah. <laughs> so the other part of this, and guys, you need to know this if this ever happens in your agency. I was unaware of this. The bank has given me what they call a provisional credit of $19,771. Well, what does that mean? That means that if through the course of the investigation, they find out that I did this somehow or the you yeah. know there was something going on, they do have the right to come back in and take that $19,771 back out again Cause it's already been wired to my client as of mm-hmm. yesterday. So it is called a provisional credit, which means there's some stuff attached to that. that at least that's good that they did that. And they're not yeah. making you wait until the end, which we know how police departments are. No mm-hmm. disrespect to police. It can take a long time to do an investigation, especially if the guy used a fake name. Correct. If he would have cashed it at a quick cash check place, you probably never would find him. Right. That's right. You know, you know what they should have done? They, they should have so, made, they should have made you bond that on that amount to make sure that they'd be made whole if uh, you ran off of that money and actually had done Ooh, it. Good, we, we, good we've segue. actually done a, we've done a, we've done a bond for exact similar situation to what yeah. you're talking about. I should say exactly, but similar where somebody had sent a claim that they mailed a cashier's check, which I don't know why you would do that. Right. And then it never went through and the guy never got it. He says, right. You know, that hold that it's on there for that time is what uh, was bonded. Well, that's a beautiful segue into our podcast today, guys. <laughs> We have a guest with us today that is going to help all of us, including myself. Our podcast today, the mission of this podcast is to help you insurance agents any way we can. For a lot of you guys and girls that are out there right now listening to this, I need you to write this shit down today because there's going to be a lot of you that need to hear and understand better what we're going to be talking about today. And I realize, listen to me, guys, I realize you're going to listen to this and you're going to be like, oh, this is going to bore the spots off a giraffe. No, we're we're not going to do that today. We are here to give you great information to help you become better insurance agents. And whether you like it or not, this is part of our industry that you really do need to understand better. I think we all do. So without further ado, Please allow me to to bring our all-star guest on today and give him the introduction he's always deserved. Ladies and gentlemen, he is originally from Missouri Valley, Iowa. He currently resides in Des Moines, Iowa. He is married to the beautiful Lauren and has two beautiful baby girls, ages seven and five. He is a graduate of Iowa State University, and he began his insurance career in 2012. 
In 2016, he launched Coverage Direct, a technology platform and best-in-class sales and service center that provides a turnkey insurance division to credit unions. In addition to Coverage Direct, he is the co-founder of Zip Bonds, hyper-focused on all things surety. Zip Bonds gives agents a fast, reliable way to quickly quote contract surety bonds in a matter of minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my profound honor today to introduce to you first-time guest on the IGP, Mr. Zach Mefford. How are you, Zach? I'm really great. Thank you. That was awesome. I was wondering what this is going to sound like. You you, uh, you exceeded my expectations. <laughs> Zach, we have a lot of things to discuss today, but before we do, climb in my DeLorean, go yeah. back in time with me for just a couple of minutes and give our friends, family, listeners kind of a flavor of how you got into the insurance industry and bring us up to today. Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll skip all the, the stuff in the background, but like I was... Uh, so I'm Bradley, and I know you follow me on uh, Twitter too. So you 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 may have seen this, but it was uh, 11 years ago. It showed the uh, the junk truck. So I had a I I'd moved down to North Carolina to be around race cars and be around NASCAR. Try to work in marketing. Um, that didn't work out, and I ended up starting a junk removal company. My my dad and uncle had looked at the uh, 1-800 Got Junk franchises. It was Omaha and Des Moines. So I knew a little bit about it. Started that, and then uh, you know as things yeah, happen, uh, I went to go go back to see about a girl that uh, is now my wife, Lauren. Uh, moved to Chicago, sold that business, and I needed to get a job, man. So who's the who's the first place to hire me? Uh, it, was, it was a company called Matrix Direct. It's now AIG uh, Direct, but sold life insurance over the phone, and uh, that's that's the reason why I needed a job, man. I had to had to had to eat, like Bradley says, right? <laughs> Dude, <laughs> if if you can freaking fog a mirror, AIG will hire you to sell life insurance. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I interviewed, so I've never told this story. I was actually thinking about it the other day. Our listeners will find this funny. And I don't mean that as a slight to use that because obviously you're doing very successful or you're doing very well, well okay. for yourself. And in Liberty National, who I work for is my first cut the same, same way, uh, maybe worse. I, I interviewed. So when I was waiting on the job offer from, from Alpha, which was a company I worked at for six years, I interviewed with a guy at AIG. And I actually, he's like, well, look, just come in the office and work a day. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to hire you. We're not going to pay you, but just come work. Just kind of see how, you know, right. so he puts this guy to like, this guy's training me or whatever. And I already knew how to sell life insurance at the point. And he's like, okay, so this is what we need you to do first. Uh, we need you to write down, you know, a hundred names of people, you know, to sell life insurance to. And he looked at me and he winked and he said, phone book. I was like, really? Like, this is the, wow. you know, like, we're just going to like phone book. Like just lie. The very first thing you're gonna do, just just freaking lie. My, I, I am glad I didn't have to do that. That would have been harder. Mine was, and they were all inbound calls that they were getting in for those. But uh, when you started there, uh, you get the 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 privilege of starting in the accidental death and dismemberment mm. uh, division, right? And so it's the people that didn't qualify for term that they couldn't sell, but they didn't want to waste the lead, so they tried yeah. to sell an AD and D product. The way that it was set up, though, it just made me feel. I just I, I knew that some of the people didn't understand what they were buying, and I hated yeah. that. It, it didn't last long but I was good at it, you know, and I, and I, that's the reason I got into insurance is I, I knew I could eventually become an entrepreneur again. And right. I went down the state farm route and just realized that side wasn't for me uh, for a lot of different reasons. And then, and got into the commercial side of things. And that's, that's what really like things took off. I, I really enjoyed writing commercial insurance. One thing that Liberty did for me that I actually kind of liked, and I, and I do this a little bit today with our new people is they taught me how to sell a cancer policy. Yep. Like that was it. Like that was the only product I knew how to sell for like the first 60 days. It was like, perfect this, do this. Because if you sit here and you try to do a little bit of everything, you're going to get lost and it, you're not going to be as successful. Right. Well, then once they did that, I sort of taught myself how to do term conversion. So I was given a book of business that was like literally a book of business. It was like that. It was like a ream of paper. And I didn't get paid on any of it, but it was like, hey, here's current customers you can prospect. And I pulled out all the term policies. And I taught myself how to do a term conversion. So I actually was a year and a half into the insurance business before I'd ever actually sold a life insurance policy, like the normal way I was doing cancer policies and term conversions. And I remember I went to work for, I left there and went to work for state farm. And I was like, what do you mean they have to do a paramed? Like, yeah. what's that? Like, I didn't know, I, I, I didn't yeah. know that was yeah. a thing, you know? <laughs> oh, Guys, I, I have one of the most embarrassing stories in the history of insurance to admit to everybody on the show today. And I have not thought about this in years, but since Bradley brought it up, I'm going to pull the bandaid off. Oh, so wow. my senior year of college, 
fr- friend or family member was, I think it was a friend of mine that was pretty high up with MetLife. And they, they want to interview me for a position selling life insurance for MetLife. And at that time, I did not know anything about insurance. I'm just trying to make a good first impression. So they call me in for the initial interview. They have me fill out a bunch of information. They talk to me. Will they give me to take home with me the same thing that Bradley was talking about? You know, the, it was a piece of paper or probably 10, five or 10 pieces of paper. And they were just all lined with number one through a hundred. And they're like, so part of your interview process is we need you to give us the names of a hundred people that you know that That, might we're going to pillage that might, you know, need life insurance. Well, heck, I, I, you know, I don't know anything about anything at that point. I don't even know what I don't know. I go back college and I sit down y'all and I write out the name. I want to say I did name and phone number of a hundred people that I knew that might need life insurance. I hand it back into them. They gladly take that. And then I don't accept the job. So now they've got, they're probably still calling on those poor people today. There's something poetic to the beautiful ignorance of being so not versed in a subject, but willing to like jump head first into like, like it's almost like, it's like Mick Hunt has, we've talked about Mick Hunt has a, a client who has a producer that Mick is coaching that's doing like 400 K a month in premium, but nobody's told him that that's a lot. Like, it's like, there's something, uh, poetic about that. Like, Hey, look, we're just going to call him. We're going to say, you need life insurance. And like, you don't even know about all the, it's like the person who drives home and narrowly misses an accident because they got called at a red light, but they have no idea that they narrowly, they narrowly missed the accident because they got caught at the red light, you know? Yeah, I don't know it, if you're trying to tee this up for exactly what we're going to get into or not, but you're exactly. doing it really well. This is just what we do, brother. This is just the Man. conversations that Scott and I have. Okay, can I share a story? Just sure. real quick on how this Absolutely. all started, right? Absolutely. I don't think we're, I should. This is secret, secret time right now. Secret time. So, so okay, you got to picture this. I'm in this this company. It's a nice company because it's an insurance company. It has a brokerage. That's how I started when I was selling commercial insurance. Okay, they gave me a phone book. Here you go. There's there's my training. Start calling people and asking if you can get quotes. I'm, and I'm not making that up. We had this guy, if he, if uh, I don't think he uh, listens to the podcast, but if he does and hears this, he's going to still take credit for the fact that he trained me. He didn't train me. He gave me some. Oh, uh, I have one of those too. Yeah. Don't you just hate those people? My single motivation, and I've told him this, so it's not something I'm saying that he doesn't know. My single motivation at that time, because he was trying to take credit for it and he was just, he just drove me up the wall. My single motivation to be successful was so he would leave me alone. Yeah. I just wanted to sell something so he would leave me alone. And I remember sitting there and it was, they call it peanut gallery because everyone was listening to me cold call because everybody that was around me, they were all, you know, account managers or, you know, people that were working on different things. In fact, Ryan, my business partner now was on the opposite side of the cubicle and he took pity on me because he, you could see how much I was actually trying to, to, to make something right. happen. And I think he actually remembers this call. So I'm sitting and I'm talking to this guy. I finally get his hat bad on a, I think it was a concrete account. And uh, he goes, hey, you guys, uh, if you want to write my, my insurance, quote, it's like, you guys do bonds? You guys got a bonding program? And I go, bonds? Yeah, sure. We go, I, you know, I'm literally going to call him like, do we do sh- surety bonds? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 We do surety bonds. I, no, I didn't even know what it was. I had no idea what he was talking about because I was so green. I just didn't have a single clue. And then I go over to Ryan, who's, uh, you know, the guy's got more letters behind his name than anything. He's got the entire alphabet, you know, CIC, CIS, <laughs> MBA. And I was like, what do you know about this? How are you, you know, like, help me out, man, figure out what we got to do here. And he looked at me and he's just like, dude, I, I don't know anything about church bonds. I don't know a single thing. So I'm thinking to myself, all right, this guy knows more than anything I've ever, uh, of anyone I've ever met with commercial insurance. And he's a super smart guy and he doesn't know anything about it. I can't be the only one. Right. And then that started the process, right? Like I, I try to go down and try to meet these different people, you know, in the surety companies. And then I start realizing like they have no formal training. No one's holding anybody's hand mm-hmm. explaining this and they don't do a very good job of it. And I think our space still hasn't caught up to that with, you know, just trying to explain what's the difference between insurity, insurance and surety, you know? And so go into that. Like, cause like oh, one no. of the things we wanted to talk about yeah. was like, we wanted to educate our audience on right. bonds and yeah. So, so Zach, before you go into that, Right. Okay. Let's create a baseline for all of these agents, because I think we start with a start and end with the end. So the first thing I'm going to do before you go into that is I'm going to give our audience the definition of a surety bond. So 
and then you can take it from there. But a surety bond provides a financial guarantee that contracts and other business deals will be completed according to mutual terms. It protects consumers and government entities from fraud and malpractice when a principal breaks a bond's terms the harmed party can call the bond and make a claim on the bond to recover losses does that sound correct the hell did you just say yeah exactly like that's the the webster's version of it can i put it in layman's terms please the surety bond is a third party three-party contract that takes care of it's a promise to take care of someone else's broken promise it's a co-signer that's what it is Right. right right You, you go, so, so this is the easiest way I can explain it. You know, when you go get your first vehicle loan, you go to get that, you're probably working something, you know, part-time, uh, maybe you're in high school and for me, it was sacking groceries. Maybe somebody's working fast food, right? You go in there and you say, you want to go buy a, a $50,000 car. Are they going to laugh you out of the place? Absolutely. Yes. Right. But if you walk in there with one of your parents and say, Hey, he's making enough to, to make this payment. And I'll go ahead and co-sign for this because I know he's going to make that payment regardless of anything else that, that happens. And he's got the money to do it. Yeah. Maybe they're going to give you that, that, uh, that loan. Right. That's a surety bond. That's that's what it is, right? And so yeah. I don't think that anyone's really um I shouldn't say no one's ever done it, but there needs to be more of the uh just layman's terms version of what these things are because right. I think a lot of people are faced, me included at first, you know, just intimidated by not knowing what I didn't know. And and I've kind of got one of those attitudes where like I don't I don't mind looking like the dumbest guy in the, the, the room. I'll ask the question. I don't really care. I make fun of myself all the time. So I'll jump in and ask. And that's how I started to kind of, you know, as I say, peel the onion and figure out what it is. But it's not as complicated as everyone wants to make it or or, or it may seem. It's so, funny. It's such a physical product, like like such a simple product in its physical, yeah. what it is. But it's a subject that just confuses a lot of people, myself included, right? Right. So let's break it down further. Okay. So okay. you look at you look at bonds of people, you know, there's different types of bonds. There's commercial bonds, there's contract bonds, fidelity probate, different things, you know, we can get into those if you want to, but for the majority of what I think agents will see would be your commercial bonds. A lot of those are very little underwriting. So I like to compare that to more like personal lines, uh, your license and permit. I sometimes say it's like, it's like the renter's insurance of, of surety bonds, right? You don't, there's not a whole lot of underwriting that goes on here. It's pretty inexpensive. It's direct pass through. We call it, uh, it's our, it's our select pay print, right? And then you get into contract bonds and contract bonds, uh, are more aligned with what I would say is like commercial insurance, you know, and, and typically that's, you're going to have like a, a contractor that wants to go bid a project mm-hmm. and that bond, that bid bond is there to protect the uh, municipality or whoever it is that's uh, putting these bids, you know, out for the, the RFPs out and wanting to make sure that, look, if you put this bid in that you're good, you're, you're good to your word. You're actually going to do this work for what you say you're going to do that work for. Now, now, is that the same as a performance bond? So, so good, good question, right? So if they win the, the bid, then they have terms in that contract that will say that you need to perform the work to the contract as it's stated, you know, here mm-hmm. throughout the, the duration of the contracts. And then you got to make sure that on the payments side of that, right? So performance and payment bonds that you're going to pay your suppliers, your subs, everybody else along the way. Mm-hmm. Right. Gotcha. And then at the end of it, there's usually uh, terms for a, for a maintenance period. You're going to have uh, the maintenance on that is the work that you've done good enough to be able to stand a time of X. You know, usually that's two, three, four years, depending on what state city that, that you're in. And so the thing I really want agents to understand is if you think you're confused by it and you don't feel like you <laughs> understand it, whatnot, imagine that contractor that wants to go bid that job, how that guy feels, that girl feels trying to go bid that work and doesn't understand it. Right. 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 And, and we, we operate under uh, four principles here. It was, it was a joke. And, you know, it started off saying that the, the bar is so low in our space there's only four things you got to do well to be better than 90% of the, the, your competition. Be nice. Tell the truth always, especially when it's not always in your best interest, right? Always be available and give a, we, we call it genuinely care now. And I don't know how y'all feel about uh, you're cussing on your show. So I'll say that, but get that, after that it. it, right? What, what's Go that? ahead. Get after it. So just give a shit, right? Yeah. Literally just give a shit. And if you're an agent that goes to a contractor and shows that you give a shit to walk them through it, because they're intimidated by it as well, you're going to have a client for life. Yep. You know, you, yeah. you don't even have to, they'll, they'll give you their PNC because you figured out how to help them with something that helps them grow their business. That's what, what we've I want seen, to do. What we've seen in the contract and bid bond, because we have, we don't do a lot of contractors. I don't do as many contractors as Scott does. We all know he loves to write contractors, but we do, uh, that was a joke. We, uh, we have a, a, a one guy who is a 
a, a big, big lawn care company and another guy who runs a, a sanitation waste management company. And both of them do city contracts, municipal contracts. And what we've seen in a lot of cases is they want, the city wants the, them to either get a bid bond initially or write a $5,000, get a $5,000 cashier's check, yep. which will be returned to them upon either acceptance, you know, upon either acceptance or, or decline. And then once it's accepted and they get the job, then that's when the performance bond comes into place. So can I, so can I share something right now why that's yeah. a really dangerous thing to do? And, and I, I figured it was, yeah. so I wanted to get your, your thoughts on it. Okay. So I'll tell you, this, this actually happened. This is one of the things before we started Zip was a client that uh, had reached out to us and wanted help with that. He put down a $10,000 cashier's check to secure his bid, would not qualify for a payment or performance bond and didn't even know he needed Ooh. to go through the process to figure it out. So they so guess, what he, money. So guess what he just lost. Yeah. Yeah. Up to that $10,000 they put down to secure his bid. And so mm. that's why you want to go through that process. Now, but now if you go through the process of being fully underwritten and saying, Hey, you know, you're, you're qualified for a performance or payment bond. Right. But then you have the cash and you want to put it down a $10,000 check to be able to do it instead of doing a good one, knock yourself out. I mean, we don't charge for them. I don't know why you do it, but I mean, go for bid it. Bond, yeah. Cash. Most companies don't charge for bid bonds. No. Yeah. No. That's another thing that kind of blows my mind. But, and, but nobody talks about that because they think that he is. And then, yeah, I'm sure there's some people that charge service fees or whatnot. I mean, we choose not to do that, but it, you're not saving any money. So why would you want to put your own money on there, right? Um, so that's contract, right? Let's, so let's back up into commercial just to make sure we don't get too far off, off track of that. That's the other thing I want to make sure everyone understands. So if you have a license and permit bond for, uh, as a, let's just use a contractor again, for your city, your village, whatever it is that uh, you know, says you have to be bonded up to $10,000, right? I'll give you a prime example of why why these uh, these cities ask for that. You guys ever had any storm chasers come through your your neighborhood after uh, uh, like Bradley a uh, 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 yeah uh, hurricane and they're still and here from Sally in 2020. Okay, uh, have you ever heard of anybody that's actually um, uh, come grabbed a huge deposit and then skipped town? Yeah, yep. I mean it's, you hear the stories all the time, right? Yep. That's right. what the bonds there for. If they're bonded, right, and that's why people should be asking, just like I'm sure you advise people to ask the contractors insured because somebody gets hurt on your property, right? You're going to want to make sure they have insurance. I want to make sure that they're bonded because if they run off with your money, that's where they pull that money from. So that $10,000 is going to help cover that $2,500 down payment or whatever the case may be. I wonder be. how many people have had that happen and the contractor's actually bonded and they don't know that they can do that. I'm sure yeah. that happens a all, lot. All the time. People think they just have to eat it. Zach, yeah. Zach, I have a question that everybody's thinking about right now. Yep. So I've got a contractor working at my house on the roof. Now, I hate to paint with a broad brush right now, but most contractors are liars. <laughs> so yeah, for our clients, so have you guys seen the, have you guys seen the Ron Swanson clip uh, where he's like miserable? Um, all lying. contractors are miserable. Like Scott shared that <laughs> the other day. He said, we play this on loop in our office. So Ugh. 100 people ask 100 of their contractors if they are bonded. 100 times that contractor is going to say yes. <laughs> right. Right. We're keeping it real, baby. Probably because they real. think they're insured and that means they're bonded. So how does that homeowner, after asking the contractor, are you bonded? And he looks them dead in their face and goes, oh, of course we're bonded. Yeah. What do they do next? Say, can I have a copy yeah. of your bond? Yeah. So, uh, similar to like you would have a certificate of insurance, right? Yeah. You can provide proof of coverage. That's what you would do. And if you're a really smart homeowner, because no one's ever figured out how to doctor a, a certificate of insurance, your, your buddy with the checks never is probably, do that. Never. Yeah, your, your buddy with the checks is probably offering that as a service somewhere on uh, Fiverr, right? Uh, Helping <laughs> with uh, the COIs. I've had right? that happen to me. In, so uh, recently, uh, recently, the by the way, Bradley, 60 days, 60 yeah. days. Okay. Yeah. So what, Unlike what, what Scott before? just did, I'm not going to talk about an open investigation. Okay. <laughs> just, just kidding. All right. So, okay. So if you are in, in people, here's another thing to take for agents, right? I don't know what to write about. I, I can't put together any con content, right? What are you doing to help your insureds understand how to verify that that certificate of insurance or that bond is right? Mm. Very simple. Call the company that is listed on there and verify what they gave you is accurate. <laughs> yep. Right. Help, help your clients understand how to do that. Make that a blog, you know? Yep. And, so that, and I, I assume, I assume Zach, it is a red flag when you as a homeowner ask for that certificate of insurance and that proof of the bonding 
and the GC or the home builder goes, oh yeah, we're, we're, yeah, man, we're, we're bonded and we're licensed. I'll get you a copy of that, but they don't ever get it to you. Right. Well, and they don't go, they don't go work on my house. That's what I'd say. Yeah. You know, you gotta, you gotta keep it from getting going on there. And, and then and that's another value you could provide. I don't know how you guys feel about it. I'm not trying to tell you how to run your business, but if someone's doing that, why, why not let some, why not let one of your team members just look it over real quick? Right. Yeah, that, that could really quickly become an opportunity for you. Oh yeah. We, we do that. We have the few contractors we have that actually sub work out. We tell them, Hey, if you'll run by all of the, the certificates to me, not only do you have that as a record, but we can verify the coverage. And, we, and it's actually happened with the few amount that we insure. It's happened a few times where we're like, Hey, you need to call this person and ask them to increase this limit. And, or, or this particular company, you know, they, God forbid, it's like a next policy. I'm like, well, ex it excludes this, this, and this, yeah, just so yeah. you know, but it's also a really, really good lead source as well. Well, how many times uh, have you ever run into, and you know, I'm not trying to tee up something that hasn't, but does that contractor appreciate the fact that you actually, you know, gave a shit to, to, mm -hmm. to figure out what they had and said, man, nobody ever told me that. I didn't know what I was yep. buying. I just bought this thing for this piece of paper because I knew yep. I had to have it to show people that I had insurance, right? Yep. Uh, unless they're lying. Yeah. Yeah. And then instead of having a sense of gratitude, appreciation, whatever it is, they're going to be defensive. Yeah. Well, why do you need that? I don't know. I don't understand. I told you we had insurance. I told you we were bonded. Why do you need a copy? You know, you know how they're going to do. I've, I've okay. seen it a hundred times. Not, you're not doing this job. Right. So Zach, I have a very important question that some insurance agent in the middle of Wisconsin just put into my mind. All right. Here's the question. When I go to do a surety bond, through a blue blood carrier, I'm going to throw some names out there. Nationwide has a, most of the, a lot of the blue blood carriers have a bond department, right? So Not because they're good at it, just because they feel like they have to. Correct. So if I go to one of those carriers, which is used to be what we did every time they want the person's third grade teacher's name and number, personal <laughs> financial statement, tax returns from the past 10 years, the parents of the wife's personal financial statement, they want all their kids' names, where they go to school, and what the last seven cars you drove. That's, that's a that's want. a performance bond application right there that you just went it through. Is. Now, now, but then you go to Zip Bond or Propeller, which a lot of people use both of them now. And of course, you're you you are the co-founder of Zip Bond. You mm -hmm. get this fast, you know everybody I know that uses you guys and uses propeller both and we use both. I think Bradley uses both. It's like, uh, the agent will call me and they'll be like, my God, that was the easiest thing I've ever done. So how, how have y'all kind of cracked the code of on not having to provide 27 years of information to get a, to get a bond. Okay. So man, uh, loaded question. We are, are on the same page. You just described this contract, right? So we've, we've, made the difference between commercials more like personal lines this is more like yeah, commercial insurance right right you're gonna go write a contractor or any any business for that what's what's an underwriter gonna ask you for on the commercial side of house what are they gonna want three years of loss runs exactly what you're we'll talk asking, about what the loss runs are right so, so so when you take you want me to talk about it for surety because that's what i'm trying to describe here you yeah, want to say yeah. commercial insurance surety so, surety so for, that's loss what, runs that's for surety is. yes so exactly what you just described, Scott, all those different things that are on there, what they're trying to figure out, that's that's the loss runs for surety. It's trying to get that financial information, okay? When you look at the difference between what um, surety is as, as a difference from insurance, it's underwritten to a 0% loss ratio, okay? It is, it is, even though it is regulated as an insurance product, it's a lot more like a financial product, right? You're, you're writing a loan and you wanna make sure you don't lose any money on it. And the difference between those two is if you have a, a claim on an insurance product that claims paid out by the insurance carrier and you move on and there's nothing else you have to worry about. They took care of it. Not the case with a surety bond. That surety bond, you are indemnifying yourself to that contract. Meaning if they have to pay out that money from that bond company, just like if you stop paying your uh, contract in the middle of a project and they're going to put a lien on your, on your house, yeah. that surety company comes back after the person of whom they underwrote that surety bond for. Correct. So the reason why they ask for all that information, right, is because they want to make sure that they're similar to like, why do you have to fill out so much stuff for a mortgage? Right. Right. So, so when people ask, well, why, why does my spouse have to sign off on this? Well, do you, do you share a checking account? I, I know I do. I mean, most, right. most do, right. You, you, you can't just get out of this because of a divorce because a divorce is one of the things they're trying to underwrite for. 
Right. right. And so that's that's what they're looking at. And that's why they're asking for that information. Now, to answer your well, question, about how we made it simpler. Right. What do you think the loss ratio is in surety, especially a like contract surety? What, what do you what do you, I mean? Take a guess. How many losses do you think they actually incur? No idea. None. Any guesses, Bradley? One percent. I would tell you that this, it's so few that most carriers, if you talk to them and they've been around for a while, they can actually tell you each specific one and why it went, went down the way that it did. Because and is so that why good. they pay most carriers pay 30% because the profits are so good on them? It's, it's interesting. It's like you're trying to make the expense ratio somewhat higher so you can try to stay off the, the radar of, of, of somebody that might be looking at why those are, are you, know, you know, printing money on it. So yeah, that's exactly what it is, right? It's, most companies that I've talked to that say that they track it, most of them don't, to be honest with you, but it said it's less than 5%, right? We have, um, we have data from SFAA have gone over it. It's not coded as well as I'd like for it to be able to say it with the definitive amount, but it's definitely less than 20% on average for the smaller contract stuff that, that we deal with. Now, let me correct you on something. I agree with what you just said, <laughs> where that falls short is in, 20, in 2008 and 2009, when the mortgage crisis hit and all of the home builders in America were going under and the general contractors were going, going under and going out of business, a lot of those companies had bonds in place when that happened. And, and I would venture to believe that at that point in time, bond companies were scrambling because there probably were a lot of bonds that were getting called at that period of time because the industry, the construction industry itself was going underwater. Yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, the, the numbers I was giving you, I should have clarified is within the last five years is what I was Correct. Uh, where that comes from. I, I would also say too, when you, when you look at the losses that they, they do incur, it's not always up to the bond penalty amount. Right. Because that's not always what it costs. Just like with the limits you have on insurance, just because you have a million dollar general liability policy doesn't mean it pays a million dollars every time. Right. Right. Um, it's set up through there. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there were some that went through there. I would say in that specific case, the ones that I would, I would have imagined had the worst time would have been those subcontractors working for larger GCs that went under. Right. Because, and they're they're sub bonded back to that, that GC and that project. And they're just kind of stuck with I'm not getting paid. So I can't I, I'm right. what do you do? Right. right? And that's why right. that's why it's so important to understand and work with somebody who's looking at that contract to figure out what's the what's the domino effect here. You know, when you get your mortgage, they're going to see, does anybody else have a stake in this? Right? Where, what, where, are we, where are we at as a placement on that, on that lien? You know, if we had to mm -hmm. come after this person. And and the other reason that they want a spouse on there, too, is you know, guys and girls in the construction industry are moving money around and they're file, they'll yeah. file for file for bankruptcy. Maybe. Well, when you get that spouse attached to that, yeah. then it's a lot harder to get out of that. It's a lot harder to, you know, Scott's cool. going to file for bankruptcy, but my wife's not. So, but she's not on the bond. So I don't have to worry about that. And we got divorced. I, I know somebody that got divorced for uh i think tax reasons so so you asked uh the answer your last question right how do we make it easier how do we do things like that well i sure. can tell you that you know um I, I can really only speak to what we've done and we look at it with zip our, our initial focus is, is solving a problem that we had right which was if i go do a small contract um application through one of these fast track programs or these you know quick credit based ones it, my experience was that it wasn't always just credit based and so my question to the underwriters was was this is credit the best indicator on underwriting these these types of bonds is it is it the only thing that we should be considering are you taking any other data or trying to look at anything else that you can get rather quickly and, and the answer well of course it is that's the way we've always done it like this is just what we do we do the, the credit score there are so many different variants in credit scores and what they pull and how they pull things and, and, and what those things look like but my my follow-up question to that was always if your losses are really that low how do you know it's the best indicator Mm -hmm. what's your favorite color could be a good indicator. Who knows if you have less than a 5% loss ratio, how do we know this is, you know, uh, specifically, you know, what um, is the best use of uh, how to underwrite these. So, so our, you know, uh, the zip score that we created was a way to pre-qualify somebody. It, it takes literally just a few minutes up to $750,000. That's awesome. And we don't ask for a social security number and we don't pull hard credit. During that time. And, and, and anybody in this space that knows anything about it, like, how are you doing that? Why are you doing that? It's a pre-qualification that allows you to find out there's, you can pull enough data on somebody to be able to understand whether or not they should qualify for that amount. 
what the API that we're building out right now for it, very soon to be released. Um, you'll 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 be doing it in real time. You'll have it in seconds. You'll do it right now. You know we're still processing and looking looking um, you know at stuff behind the scenes, but it's it's similarly to you know saying like should I be able to get pre qualified before I start looking for a house? Absolutely, that's what this is. Now, right. the one thing that I, I specify every time we talk to to an agent, do a demo, um, or just anybody in the space that that asks questions about us, it's a pre qualification. Right. We still want to see the contract to make sure that the people that are doing the trade they say they do are bidding jobs that fall in line with what they want. Uh, we still want to make sure we look at the contract, to understand if there's you know, a different maintenance period than, than what we have expected. Make sure that we, they understand what liquidated, liquidated damages are and, and how that would impact them if they can't get that project done on time. We still want to go through that whole process. Right. But, you know, for something that's less than a million dollars with that low of loss ratio, you're going to be able to tell pretty quick if somebody's credit worthy person without having to pull hard credit. Right. Zach, I've got a question for you. If a subcontractor, and we have a few of these on the books that do work for global GCs or for national GCs that are doing building high rises all over the country and stuff like that. If they're doing a lot of that work throughout the country, isn't there a way and you're going to have to help me out with this because I can't remember the name of what this is, but isn't there a way almost like to get, and I hate to, I hate to compare it to this, but almost like a line of credit where they, instead of doing a new bond every time yeah. they do like one bond and it, but it's, of course, you got to change the language for whoever you're doing the work for, but it, you don't have to go through this yep. process every time. Yep. So, so yeah, what you're describing is like what would be like your aggregate limits or what do you have? It goes up to a certain amount. It's a bonding capacity. That's what that's bonding what you, capacity, right? What's your bonding capacity? And so even though, you know, our zip scores focus on some of that small contract stuff, we can and, and, and do every day work with larger contractors who need three, four, five, six million dollars of bonding capacity. Right. And, and that's, that's where things really get fun. Cause that stuff's uh, it's, you know, talk about peeling the onion. There's a lot of different things that you can get into there. That's uh, I, I find fascinating, but you know, that uh, that capacity is what they're looking for. If they're going to bid these jobs, because they don't know when they submit, say uh, a bid for something on a Tuesday, but also send it out on Thursday, if they're going to get both of them or, or, or not either, yeah. of them, you know, right. Um, but that's what you're asking for. And yeah, that's, that's what, what we do, but the, each one has its own uh, performance of payment bond for the project, but the capacity allows them to, to, to go up to a certain amount. So sure. when, when you, th when I think about the bonding world, the bonding world pre-zip, it's a very, we've always done it this way world. And I don't mean any disrespect by this, but when I think about some of the agents that I know of that are known for doing bonds, right. you know, they are definitely the more seasoned, you know, agents, right? <laughs> And I, and I don't, like I said, I don't mean that negatively. It's just this, to what I've observed. Have you guys gotten any pushback because you're coming in and you're talking about creating a brand new product, this zip score, and you're talking about APIs and I'm sure you've gotten the, what's an API question and, oh, yeah. and, and being, you know, the, the direct to consumer capabilities and all of that stuff. Like, like, have you gotten any kind of like people who are like, I don't know if they're, they're skeptical or, or legitimate pushback, like what? Talk about kind of how that's been, because that that does seem like a little bit of a, a big bear to climb. But at the same time, it's blue ocean in this in this industry. I mean, if you're the sure. you know, you, you're the only one doing it the way that you're doing it. Uh, to answer your question, yes, all the time, always. Yeah. Push back against that, because when you're um, I know what you're trying to say, you're trying to politely describe the age, the image, the whatever, you know, like the. Yeah. Because you know, what's the average uh, age of a, an insurance agency owner, you know, independent agency owner in, in the United States. And we all know that, that story. Right. And so, yeah, yeah the answer is a hundred percent. That's what we get pushed back on. Right. That that's, that's why we went after this. Right. It was a problem I legit had and I wanted to fix it. And it was super selfish because initially it was a problem I had that I wanted to do. And then, and then it was the part that's not selfish. I want to help other agents be able to do those things that I, nobody was there to help me, me do. But yeah, the pushback is why do you know this is going to work? The simple answer is we don't. Yeah. That's the truth. You know, that's our pillar. Tell the truth. We don't know that it's going to work, but I feel very confident in the model that we've created and the ability to pull third party data and put it in a way where we can get close enough to what would be a hard credit score. I mean, think about think about uh, home and auto insurance. How many of you guys remember the days where you had to pull a social security number every single time you did a quote? Yep. Do you do that anymore now? The company I left still does, but I don't. See what I'm saying? Like that's that's the, the natural progression of, of yeah. how this needs to evolve and where it needs Correct. to go. 
And are we and as get- you get more data, your product should get smarter and smarter and smarter where you you can take a minimal amount of data from someone, but use this mountain of aggregated data in a data lake or whatever and say, okay, the odds tell us that this person's going to qualify. We don't have to pull all this stuff. You know, it's, it's supposed to get smarter as you go. Right. That's exactly what we're doing. And so when we started developing this initial hypothesis, we, we, um, we contracted a data scientist that was a super sharp guy helping us go through this and better understand like what data makes sense. Right. And, and is it perfect? Are we there? Like, I don't know. I don't know yet. I mean, we're probably going to take some months at some point to, to figure this out, but anything worth doing that's, that's going to happen. But he, he had helped, he worked for a financial institution during, uh, 2009, 2010. And what his job was to do at that time was to try to help find the people who were impacted by the recession for with different factors that weren't really a good indicator of why their credit was hit mm. and that it would be a good person to uh, provide credit cards to because that person may have had some sort of financial troubles, but it was directly impacted by things that were mostly out of their control. And so we used some of that type of process to create this along with what um, mostly I would say Ryan would know from having developed an insurance product from scratch. Uh, and, and understanding, you know, what goes into um, actuary, you know, and, and, and figuring it out. So I, again, it just, it was a problem we had and wanted to fix it. That's what we've done. And, and to the point of which it doesn't fit that model. The other thing I wanted to fix, I don't know if you guys have ever run into this when you, when you do uh, and Scott, probably maybe more so with the nationwide, but if they say no to that bond and they can't do it, where do you go? Right. You're going to a broker, right. Trying to figure right. that out. And what do you have to do? Explain the whole story all over again and try right. to start from scratch. I hated that. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be a one-stop shop. I wanted to be able to provide a solution as a plug-in to someone else's agency where they say, look, I can't compete with XYZ agency because they're the, you know, the, the assured partners of the world. The, you know, for me around here, uh, I was getting beat up a lot by Holmes Murphy because they had their own surety division, right? Well, we didn't have that. I want to be able to provide that option for agencies to say, look, we'll be good at what you're doing with personal, uh, I'm sorry, PNC, and let, let Zip just be a plug-in for what we're doing on that because that's the solution that I wish I would have had. Zach, that is a perfect segue. <laughs> what do you normally, what, what does your system normally for just a, you know, just a regular surety bond that somebody needs and in, in your quoting platform, what information do you guys need? So, for, so the commercial side, what we need is typically, you know, the real basic stuff. We want the, the business name, tax ID, address, contact information, things along those lines, right? Yeah. Um, and they need to let us know where they where they need a bond because there's different bond penalties and uh, premium rates. On the contract side, to get started, it's it's uh, we verify, we want to know bankruptcy. Now, obviously, the, uh, the normal information, business name, tax ID, um, how many business partners you have. Wanna, we want it because we want to make sure we add those on there, our model checks to see, um, or it checks both or multiple. If you have three or four, we would check all of those, but also bankruptcy, past bankruptcy, past bond claim. Uh, we, we pull, uh, we, we track which uh, general liability carrier they have for their insurance side. I think anybody that's been uh, doing insurance long enough might know that there's some differences between a couple of different companies and why they might be with a certain company and, and how that could be a good indicator. But that, I mean, that's the basic information that we need to be able to pull that for the, for the zip score. You, you go into the bigger stuff and then you're going to start needing to get personal financial statements, right? Yeah. I'll tell you, you guys, I didn't plan on giving a testimonial here, but we had one of those clients that I mentioned uh, needed a performance bond for a municipality. He was told by another bond company, um, yeah, you qualify for this. Yeah, we can do it like three months in advance. And then uh, when it came time to actually buy the bond, they wanted a bunch of it was, it was above and beyond the financial information that Scott mentioned a while ago. And his uh, accountant told him, he's like, this is going to cost you like $10,000 for me to pull all this together in two days. And so I, I shot it over to, to Zach at Zip and you guys got it done in 48 hours. Yeah, and he less was, than two business days. Good to go. Yeah. Yeah. He was good to go. Yeah. And we're super easy to work with. Like, this is not a testimony. Like I'm not, this is, you know, but like it was, it was really, really, really good. So, as, you, as usual, we're getting paid nothing for this. Correct. Oh, well, and, and honestly, guys, like you know, I appreciate that very much. I appreciate the opportunity too to be able to do that. And um, you know, I, I I don't I tell you we work with we can't be miracle workers all the time. There's certain things that we just can't get done. We, yeah, we can't. Yeah. There's one in particular, and I hope he listens to this podcast because I consider him a friend. And there's one that uh, that we didn't get done. It, it'll bother me. It'll haunt me for the rest of the time that I do. <laughs> Wake this up in a cold sweat thinking about just, a, a surety bond. 
Well, yeah. I mean, it was the reasons why too, you know, it's like we, we just being newer, right. We didn't have, we couldn't throw our weight around like some of these huge brokers did. That's yeah. the truth. Right. And that's yeah. what happened in this situation. And, and it'll, I said, it'll haunt me until, you know, we never had that again, but uh, there are certain times guys where, where they should not be bonded. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. You know, they, they, they're, they're, the company's trying to protect them from getting into a position where they won't be able to do it. But you know, by God, if there's a way to get it done, we want to make sure that we are able to provide that option. And, you know, again, it's education too, and helping, helping people understand why they need certain things, even if it is additional information. Zach, I think it's self-explanatory that agencies can use surety bonds. Cause remember guys, when, when we talk about these, these surety bonds, performance bonds, things like that, that's usually before a project gets started, we're, we're getting all this information together. I think it's self-explanatory that you could use writing bonds and helping people with that. And you mentioned this earlier yep. to kind of get your foot in the door that kind of cracks the door open yep. to build that relationship with a prospect or client. And not only are you helping them, which is all that sales is, is helping people. It's really not sales. It's helping people. Solving and problems. then, and then, and then the next thing, you know, you're writing their business auto, you're writing their GL. I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but here, here's the last question that I had for you today that I find intriguing. How can these guys and girls out there that are selling insurance every day, where do they find the, the people that need bonds? Where can they go to kind of help them find people that might need that type of work to get, get their foot in the door? Right. So great question. But just when I was cold calling, my pitch was very simple. My, my, my pitch as a commercial producer is, you know, um, I, I know you're busy. I don't want to bug you too much. My name's Zach. I have a specialized program for X contractor. I'd love to give you a quote before your next renewal. And I talk fast anyway. So usually like, can you repeat that again? You know, try to go through it. Um, uh, but what do you mean you specialize in it? Right. And so I would talk through, I would say, I'm glad you asked, you know, we, we developed a, a way to help understand your workers' compensation better. Uh, we also created a, a, a specialty, um, division for, for surety bonds. You, do you, do you bond any public work? No, no, I don't do that. I do that. So that, that's my pitch to get in the door when you're talking. So when you ask, how do you find those people? I can, I could go into detail for hours on how I, you know, found lists of contractors to call, but when I would call and do that and start getting those people that might be interested the idea behind the zip score product is let's pre-qualify, at least get some sort of bonding capacity. If you haven't done it before, it takes seconds to yeah. be able to put that information in. And here's what I'm going to do for you. After that, you know, don't even talk about PNC at that point. Mm-hmm. Say, I'm just going to, I'm going to pull some, some bid tabs in your area and try to find some different jobs that you might want to consider, you know, to, 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 to bid on in the future. And I'm going to help you walk through that process and understand what you need to do. You're creating value. Well, I'll tell you too, everybody lists, or not everybody listens, but a lot of people listening to this know how difficult it is to do Google search ads in insurance. Insurance is the highest cost per click, I believe, of any industry. If it's not the highest, it's it's the next highest. Like the word right. insurance is like $70 a click. I helped my, my brother. Google Compare got out of being Google Compare because they can make more money selling, selling ads. Right, right. So I helped my brother-in-law a couple of weekends ago set up a Google ad for his lawn care business. And I was flabbergasted because I was like, yeah, you're going to have to like, you're going to need to commit like a thousand dollars a month for this to like barely yeah. work. And he's like, really? He's like, well, I got a buddy doing it for 200. And I got to look at it. I was like, Oh, your cost per click is like $3. Like, of course get right. It'll work. So the most, and I'm not super well versed in Google ads, but the most successful ad that I've ever ran on Google ads. And I've dabbled for about seven years and it's running right now as an ad for bonds. Yep. Yeah. And we're literally just using it to get leads for commercial insurance. Right. Like that's because what it, because it's like the two things that are on businesses minds are bonds and workers comp. And those are probably the two most hated lines of coverage for agents. I would say So by, by going after the thing that's on their mind, you get everything else. It's a loss. Lead. It's like Chris Paradiso, Chris Paradiso writes a lot of RVs. Mm. And the reason he writes a lot of RVs is because the, all the RVs are a lead magnet because people who have RVs, typically have two or three vehicles. They can afford an RV. They might have a vacation home that it's a big personal lines account. It's a lead generator to get to bigger and better things. And you can use, I would look at the bonds as that way. It just so happens that they pay pretty dang good as well. Yeah. And it just so happens that most of your competition is going to suck in this and it's going to take them three to four days just to get the price back. Yeah. What do y'all pay on commercial surety bonds, Zach, on a, just a, just an average surety bond. What's the percentage commission on that? 
we do 30% on anything that's our select pay print process. Anything that we have to get involved in that we work as a broker, we pay 15% on. Got you. And, and, you know, at some point that may change, um, but volume definitely has a, a play in that, but that's, that's where we're at right now with it. And it's just what's, um, it's, it's what's working. You so know, could I, could I go to, could I go to city hall uh, courthouse or, or whatever and ask somebody, I don't know who you'd ask, I guess the planning department or whatever, like what bids are coming up or could they give me a list of what bids are about you to come go, up? You can go down there if you want to. You can also, also just Google it. <laughs> just Google. Yeah. I mean, all that's public information. You know, what's, yeah. uh, uh, you know, public bids, XYZ town, whatever, you know, Mobile, you know, or, or Huntsville, just, and, and then surrounding communities. I've told, I was talking to an agent here and walking through this, and this is where in the demos, it, it becomes so much less about what the product is. And I just get super excited to want to help commercial you know guys grow their business and, and, and go through this but we're just going through and i saw them like if you just find some of those suburbs outside of the bigger areas those mm -hmm. ones are almost easier to find because they'll put it right out there there's not typically it's it can be overlooked um you know those rfps are out there though you just you just got to go go look for them well you can also i guess attend a what like a city hall meeting or get the minutes yeah where yeah. But, but if they bid well, already, right, you've already, if they've already bid that, right, you, you know, and that's a good way to find people that would benefit from bonds. Cause if they're already doing public work and they have a bond, maybe, maybe there's some pain there because they're not getting it fast enough or they're not getting the capacity they want. I don't really talk about rate that much, but I mean, that does play in sometimes with, with what they do, but if you can go find what's coming up before it bids, and now you're providing those different opportunities to that contractor, just as a way to touch them. You know, uh, if you haven't written them yet, or even if you have, and you just want to continue to drive value, I shouldn't say you only do it for prospecting, but say, Hey, this is coming up for bed in a couple of weeks. I, I caught my, caught my eye. I thought it'd be something you'd be interested in doing. You should, you know, give it a, you know, just consider, you know, bidding that work that yeah. getting out in front of it. So I, I've had two people, this is outside of what we're talking about right now. I had a person call me about a month ago and all she needed was a notary bond. So that's a money grab, really. It's $150, whatever it is, probably different super state cheap. state. Yeah, super <laughs> yep. cheap. Yep. And then and then last week I had somebody reach out to me and their grandmother had died, did mm -hmm. not have a will. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was all of her stuff was going to probate. And right. her attorney had had wanted me to put together a uh, probate bond that basically would act, would make her the administrator of the estate. That's correct. I believe. So that's another great niche. Nobody's going after. Yeah. Not, not, I should say nobody, right? Cause there's always somebody that's doing it, but you want to find something that's different. Go, go, go start prospecting those attorneys for that kind of work and go figure out how to be the expert in that. Cause right. that, is, that is one of those things that in my opinion, at least just cause I understand contracts to think a little bit better that probate stuff can be more complicated um, than it is when you're working with, with, uh, with, with contractors and bid bonds. I mean, just it's, it is to me at least, but that's probably not saying much. <laughs> so you, you can't be an expert in it. Right. And so can you print off, I know in that probate application, let me tell you what I did with that because yeah. it was fairly lengthy and I didn't yeah. want this girl to have to just sit on the phone with me and, and you know, me answered, asked, you know, 30, 40 questions, whatever it was. Some of them I didn't even know, like the case number, you know, that, that type of thing, her attorney's information. So I just, I just printed off the application and, and email scanned and emailed it to her and said, Hey, when you get a chance, fill this out, send it back to me. I'll input it into the, the software on the computer and we'll get this thing going for you. Of course, she hasn't sent that back to me yet, but. So, I mean, so that, that was what I was going to say is like the reason why I don't do it that yes, you can get a form to send it out and do that way. Right. The reason why this is my opinion, that's all it is. Sure. To not do that is because you can probably get a lot of that by calling the attorney and grabbing some of that information. Saying, hey, I'm working with Miss So and So over here, trying to put together this probate bond. You're you're creating then value not only for that that person by taking right. care of something that they really don't want to do and filling out that application, but right. you're also giving that value to that attorney and potentially giving yourself uh, an opportunity to to help them in the future when the, you know, the next client come in and to do that. So try to be able to you know take take some of that off their plate. Right. And then you call up and say, hey, Miss, you know whoever it was. Uh, great news. I was able to talk to, you know, this attorney, I got most of what I need about 10 things. They didn't quite know. Could you please help me just get these things? Sure. You know, over the phone. That's yeah, that, that would have been a better way to do that. Plus it helps you build a relationship with that attorney. Yeah. And so the next time they have problem. one of these, they, they know who they can call. Yeah. I mean, and again, yeah. And then it's just staying top of mind. That's the thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Riley, I want to say something too about your Google ads. You want to do that? Um, uh, 
and this is a challenge to agents that you know say, "Hey, I don't have enough stuff to write for content." Right? You think you think the Google ads are a lot different for bonds and their insurance? Try try organically trying to make some of that stuff happen. Right? Go find the stuff you want to write in your area. Or go find the territory you want. Go find out what bonds are required in those cities. Yeah. Go find out you know what the bond penalty is. Explain it in layman's terms. Put that stuff together. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be super polished. You can you can figure it out well enough to explain it to somebody and why they would need it and go create that content that's out there. And now next time somebody searches, especially if it's hyper local, right on Google, yeah, who are they going to find? You know, yeah. Oh, great. It's this agency down the street that helps me. You know? Well, that's, that's the, the way that you win with Google ads. And you know, this Zach, I'm more talking to the audience is, is the long tail keywords, the very specific, yep. Yep. you know, so a lot of ours are, you know, notary bond in mobile, Alabama contractors bond, you know, a performance bond in mobile, Alabama, like very, specific and it's like I've, i tried to like do a little bit of research and like what actually are they typing in when they're looking right. for these things right. and shockingly and i mean that sarcastically there's not that many people running google ads for bonds uh, because they can't do them easily there's no need to run a google ad for anything if you cannot do it easily because somebody that finds you through google is going to want it done easily That's and so right. so we've had a little bit of and i'm not gonna say a ton but we've had a it's definitely a positive roi we've had a yeah. little bit of success with it that way I should share this article you just made me think of. Uh, it's, it's about Lemonade and how they did exactly that with what they were trying to do in the renter's insurance space when they got started. It's yeah. a great article. This guy, I don't think it's Overthink Group, if I'm remembering right. But yeah, it's exactly what he talks about. It's going, and it walks you through how to be able to write that type of content and being able to, to, to do that. Um, because that's what, you know, that's what it's one of their main strategies, what they did when they started. Um, and it's easier to do that when you have a hyper focused area. You know, I'm, I'm not sure. You know, those are listening that are all, you know, local to a certain territory or state or whatever, but um, it does become easier when it's not all, all across the country. Yep. Zach, before I let you go, tell these people how, if they want to sign up for Zip Bonds, how do they get in touch with you guys? How do they get signed up? Where do they go? Yep. Zipbonds.com, top corner of the OC for agents. Um, just drop down there. You can schedule a demo. That's probably the best way to, to connect. Um, the other thing for me, specifically and bradley can speak to this firsthand uh twitter I, I i still think that's one of the best places to find people and talk about insure tech stuff and just insurance in general some of the best connections that I, come through there so it's one of the best places and people discount it it's yep. one of the best places to get a bead on things 100%. Like, like let's figure out like like what's happening in the world like where are things trending what are people talking about there's numerous twitter threads on that kind of stuff. It's so good. I mean, the content there and it's, and it's every day, there's something that's different on there. So if you want to find me, please follow it's It's at uh, Zach Mefford, Z-A-C-H-M-E-F-F-E-R-D, not O-R-D. That happens all the time. And, and yeah. it's very important to know you're an agent. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah, no I mean, better insure techs than insure techs that are created by agents because I you totally, know exactly what we need. You're exactly not some tech guy need. coming from Silicon Valley. That's like, Oh, we know exactly what people need. We need a really slick front end. And on the back end, we're going to operate exactly like an old school insurance company. The way right? that it's, we, not, it's not that. The way that we describe it is instead of trying to fix problems from the technology side and forcing it in, we try to fix things from the insurance issue out using technology on the way out to figure out, peel the onion, get to the core mm. where the problem is, start adding the technology on the way out to presenting that front end or that, that solution to the, to the public. Cool. That is the perfect end of this podcast. Guys, as I end every show, rewards come from action, not discussion. Don't even call it sales anymore. I always say, go out there and sell the shit out of insurance. Go out there and help people. That's all sales is, is helping people. You know, the, the bond market, which a lot of people in the industry don't understand, and now they understand it better, I think for insurance agents is just a value add that we can help our prospects and clients. We can add more value. We can get our foot in that door, you know, door cracks open. Well, now, now's your opportunity get to go create a relationship, spend some time with this person, get to know them better, help them with their bond, go to zip bond and, and do it quickly and efficiently get them what they need. Guess what's going to happen the next time they need something in the world of insurance? Who are they going to call? Well, oh, they're going to call you. That's right. all it is, guys. We're helping people every day. Don't even call it sales anymore. Just call it helping people. That's all we're doing. Yeah. And that's, that is the beauty in the bond market. That is what you're able to do is just help people. And if you do it right and, and get to know it, not get, not be scared of it, 
next time they need something for insurance, they're going to call you and they're going to want you to do their business autos. They're going to want you to write their GL. It's all we're talking about here, guys. Go make money for your family, for your wife, for your husband, for your kid's college fund, for your parents that are struggling out there. Go make money for them. Write good business for the agencies that you represent and write good business for the companies that you represent. Bradley Flowers, I love you. Thanks, man. Thanks, Zach. Zach, Thanks, man. Appreciate this very much. Man, hey, you just moved the ball one step closer to the lighthouse for all these agents, and that is all we do on this podcast. Thank you for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me, man. Guys, you are listening to the Insurance Guys podcast, and thank you so much for being a part of our family. We love each and every one of you, and we look forward to seeing you back here real soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Insurance Guys podcast. If you need to know more about me or you need to get in touch with Scott, you can always reach me at theinsuranceguyonline.com or email me at scott at iprotectinsurance.com. And if you need to get in touch with Mr. Bradley Flowers, go to portalinsurance.com or email him at bradley at portalinsurance.com. Guys, we love you. and Thank you so much for listening to our show and being a part of our family. And we look forward to seeing you again next week on the next episode of the Insurance Guys podcast. Take care.